Well, having started racing old, uh, 45 years old, most guys start at four or five years old. I misunderstood, so I only started at 45 years old, and I raced five years in the United States under Grand Am prototypes. Oswaldo Negri, great Brazilian driver, learned a lot from him about the art of racing. Yeah. After a while, I wanted to come race in Europe and try all the big tracks here, and that uh, that allowed me to get into the into the. Uh, uh, British GT series for a while, Blancpain mm -hmm. series for yep. a while. These are all GT cars, mm -hmm. very, very fine cars, McLaren, uh, Audi R8, Ferrari, mm -hmm. etc. But there's nothing more rewarding than driving a LMP1 or LMP2 car. It's incredibly refreshing on good weather days to be in an open cockpit car. You feel incredibly emancipated. The cars have huge downforce. They are very fast and uh, this, the, the engineers working with you, you being the three drivers who are working together, take all that input and create this incredible setup so even an amateur uh, driver can drive this thing quickly. Oh yes, they're not holding you. So I had nothing to do with racing, not even a go-kart, uh, not a bicycle, nothing, uh, all my life, until some young kids on the trading floor who uh, worked for me dared me to go to a racing school. And that's what I went to and uh, you know, you can't you can't turn it down. I was very impressed with how good I was at racing. They they gave me AP, which is like advanced placement in American academics and stuff. So I was pretty proud of that until they told me it meant accident prone, and if I had one more accident, they were going to throw me out of the series. <laughs> well, when, you know, if you were to start racing in your 40s, uh, within a year or two, you've quickly figured out you either have it or you don't have it, and you can like picking up golf late. You're never going to get like the great pros, but you might you might be able to play the game nicely, and so. I figured out that I could drive competitively and, uh, and, and well for startup guys. Uh, but once you hook up with a good professional like an Oswaldo Negri or Olivier Pla here in Europe or someone like that, there's so much to learn from those people. The old style of just your, your data sheet against theirs, but now with video, you can actually get that three dimensional uh, experience from them and advice over and over again. And if you're not a complete dummy, you can apply that advice over and over again at these various tracks and, uh, and compress your time, the spread between your big gap to their times. You can bring it down to half a second to one and a half seconds. You have to be realistic. If you start in your 40s, you know, you're literally four decades behind the kids who are learning to be a go kart driver by 10. But uh, if you can keep improving, you should stay in the game. Shines like a shiny diamond in a shiny diamond ring. I've, I've learned that there's quite a few parallels between business uh, and, uh, and, and performing in a race car. I used to do leverage buyouts, finance leverage buyouts for all the big LBO firms around the world. That's what I ran on Wall Street for a while. And initially, you, you over-research everything. You overstudy every fact and all that because you don't know what you're doing. And then once you become the boss or you've done 10 years of it, you can get to the essence of it by knowing what facts to ignore. And it's identical in the car. When you start racing, every fact comes flying at your, into your eyes and into your brain and you're trying to process it and you can't process it all. So you make lots of mistakes listening to a bump in the road or something in the car that's essentially irrelevant. And so over time as you race, you get more comfortable with the violence in the car, the disruption, and you know what disruption or what fact has a chance of really hurting you. So alone is a set of facts you, you should pay attention to, very few. In competition, when there's a car next to you and next to you, there's a lot of stuff you have to pay attention to, including the insanity of the guys in the car next to you. But the biggest thing for me in, in doing deals on Wall Street versus racing was finding out what facts to ignore. Seen only by the million blinking eyes of God in the dark sky that is their island ceiling. Well, you know, when you, when you, uh, the two things that determine whether you can stay in a race car if you're an amateur, right? One is money. You have to have enough money to, to pay for the seat that you're in. And then the second thing is you, you physically, you, you, endurance racing over 60 is quite demanding on you physically. So one, you have to stay in shape. You have no choice. So you get on a bicycle. If you, you run, you do weights, whatever you swim, you know, I kayak. To take a bike out a lot. So when you get in the car, you can't be thinking about, geez, this is bad weather, ouch, I'm gonna get embarrassed. When you get into those negative framework okay. thoughts, second guessing yourself, it's time to stay at home and watch it on TV. Uh, I haven't gotten there yet, uh, but you know, every year you need to be invited by a team, you need to get approached. I, I can go hang a big bag of money over somebody's head and you can get racing, but I'm, I'm past that. I don't have to buy my way in as much anymore. I want to pay a fair price and we'll see. I'd love one more Le Mans. I've done three. Wouldn't mind doing four. I've never won a trophy there. So it'd be nice to get a podium at, at Le Mans. And we've come close. Oof, we've come close.